whakamau tai, tangaro u mai, kāwea mai. Kāwea mai ki a uh, rāki waho, kāwea rā mai ki te moana pipiri, ki te moana hōhonu, hōhonu ana te wai, hei aha rā ki uta. I felt it was fitting to start this session on oceans with um, an ancient karakia said to be uttered by Maui as he stood upon his canoe and hauled to Iko Maui out of the oceans. So and now I'm going to hand to Mark to introduce us. Okay, so we've got uh, three islanders here. We're all islanders from different islands. Um, Sue is originally from Samoa, Dan from New Zealand, I originally came from Ireland. And uh, we're going to give you three 15 minute talks. I'll give a global perspective. Um, then Sue will talk about the Pacific Islands, and finally Dan will talk about uh, New Zealand and Maori perspectives in particular. Yeah. And just to keep in feeling the tradition, I have brought uh, two malofas, two gifts. One is from Tuvalu and one is from Kiribati. So malo se po. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Welcome. Tenakoto. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sue. That's great. Okay. <clears throat> so, there's a lot of good intentions around the world. Pretty much most people, governments, international conventions have been saying that we should use the environment sustainably for, for decades. And Sue will mention a little bit about some of these a little bit more, but we have the United Nations Law of the Sea, dating from the 1980s, the Convention on Biological Diversity from the 1990s, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and pretty much everybody agrees we should be doing things sustainably. Um, and nearly 200 countries have signed these conventions. They say, well, everything should be fine, shouldn't it? Because, you know, all the powers that be agree that we should be sensible. They even say that 10% of the oceans should be within marine protected areas, although exactly how protected is a little bit uh, variable. Um, and decades earlier, the law of the sea uh, basically said we should be using the ocean sustainably. And sustainable use is primarily means not just reducing pollution, but controlling fishing. <clears throat> and it's common sense. It's kind of stupid to, throw, you know, to not sustainably use what we don't understand, what we cannot use now because we think it's unimportant if we don't use it now, or we cannot repair once we've lost it. And one of the things I champion is having some areas of wilderness where nature, we can see nature and how nature would naturally be. And these controlled sites we've discovered in New Zealand provide the reference site for knowing the effects of fishing outside them. Because fishing has been happening everywhere over a long, long time periods, um, and it's kind of gradually things change. We don't often notice what's changing. Um, so marine reserves and other protected areas, these wilderness areas, also allow us to understand what's going on, understand the ecology, understand how food webs change. <clears throat> and finally, in some cases, they protect species from going extinct. <clears throat> And there's three kind of areas that New Zealand has a responsibility for. We have our territorial sea, the coastal waters, the exclusive economic zone out to almost 200 nautical miles, and the extended continental shelf, which the government would like to have full jurisdiction over. <coughs> and you can take a very pessimistic view of the oceans. Um, so by 2030, maybe Maui's dolphin will be extinct. Maybe some of the native uh, endemic petrels and albatrosses, maybe they'll have gone extinct, both due to predators and island, as you, uh, islands, as you heard from um, some of James Russell's talks earlier in this series. Um, we'll have permanently altered ecosystems that cannot revert back to nature because a lot of the top predators are gone, or they've had such devastating impacts like happened in places on lands that things cannot revert to the way they were. Um, and we'll have compromised marine reserves because they'll be small islands in a, in a sea of destruction, as somebody referred to it recently. <coughs> Or we can take an optimistic view, and that is those populations of threatened species are recovering, in large part because of the measures already underway by many organizations, that marine reserves are, are healthy and flourishing and exporting species to the surrounding environment, has been demonstrated for Lee Marine Reserve exporting uh, snapper larvae to the wider population. We will have healthy seafood from fisheries and fish farms. We will have a booming marine ecotourism trade, and ecotour marine ecotourism, I think, in many countries now vastly exceeds the uh, commercial value of fisheries, for example. Um, and how could we do that? Well, one way is we could make 100% of the exclusive economic zone a protected area, within which only sustainable uses are permitted. Or we could have 30% of the EZ in so-called protected areas, with limited non-commercial fishing, and we could have 10% in marine reserves with no fishing. 
and the last two things have been proposed in some of these international conventions. And why do we want to protect biodiversity? I list five kind of reasons. We've got the ethical, economic, ecological, scientific, and legal ones. But ultimately, it's only the legal ones that matter, that, that really force all of society to follow what some people might want to happen voluntarily. And one of those is establishing marine reserves. And the reason it's urgent now is because we've got increasing pollution. Plastics are the, the latest thing to hit the headlines about what's happening in the sea. And these have impacts on human health through our diet. Um, conservation is urgent because the human population is increasing, overfishing, and um, also the bycatch and discards in fishing, which are something we don't see, but it's, is also impacting the environment. And this little video here comes from um, the Sea Around Us project in British Columbia, and I showed it in some of my lectures, so a few of you might have seen it before, if I recognize any of my former students. And you're probably wondering what it is. Is it some cancer plaguing the oceans? Is it plastic <laughs> pollution? It started in the 1950s. In fact, you could wind the clock back earlier in many areas. But what it is, is actually the year that the maximum sustainable yield was reached in any one fish stock in that area. So it basically illustrates that we're fishing the entire oceans. There's nowhere in the oceans that's not being fished to some extent. And this is only fish. This isn't, does not account for marine mammals which are fished hundreds of years earlier, and some of them, all, and one species, driven to extinction. So, in fact, none of the oceans are really pristine. We've, we've affected all of the oceans. And I think that's maybe one of the misconceptions, is that people talk about the oceans as being wild, but they're not necessarily pristine. And there's been a recent paper reviewing the, the trends in land and sea. Um, you may have seen these in other presentations before. It's a, it's a lovely infographic. Um, so the oceans are far less impacted than land. So the, the land situation is a lesson that, that we do not want to repeat in the oceans. Um, and this illustrates extinctions going across the scale here. We've had humans have caused extinctions of large animals on land in many areas, but what's happening in the oceans is actually relatively recent. So the oceans are still largely recoverable if we just stop having the impacts we're having. Um, so the oceans are pristine. Some species have gone extinct, but far fewer than in freshwater or terrestrial systems. And how do we know what a natural system is like? Well, the only way is by having some areas that are natural and wilderness. And marine reserves, I suggest, are those the best indicators. And the governments have taken action in many areas of the ocean, so it's not, not entirely hopeless. You know, they've got international convention and the control of uh, hunting of large whales. People have been reducing pollutants. Uh, protecting migratory species, and they stopped nuclear testing in the oceans a while ago too, as New Zealanders are very well aware. But if we think globally, what are they doing in regards to setting aside some areas of wilderness? And considering most of the oceans are owned by the public, you think this might be easy to do, since the governments already have control of them. And it's not unusual to limit public access to the oceans. People think marine protected areas, are you going to stop us going somewhere? It's entirely the opposite. Most marine protected areas are magnets for tourism. Um, and there's numerous places that are already the public is limited to going, like harbors and military zones and cable zones and so on. <clears throat> so I get a little bit of audience participation here. How much of the ocean do people think is protected in legally established marine protected areas? There's a few of you who should know this because you were in my marine protected areas course last year and the year before. So this is a special <laughs> test for your members. Um, so how many people would think we we're protecting 50% of the oceans. Nobody? Okay. How many people think 10%? A survey in New Zealand that taught the public thought 30% of New Zealand was protected. 5%? 1%? Less? Oh, okay. Oh, you're, you're already there. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's true. So if you look at the World Database on Protected Areas, it looks great. There's 9,000 marine protected areas. This looks fantastic. But they're all so small that this only accounts for about 3% of the ocean. And these statistics get a bit muddled because some things in the database shouldn't be there and some things are not in the database and so on. Um, but of those, it's the red line here is the ones that stop fishing. So most of those marine protected areas are, are basically an attempt to try to more strictly control fishing that's, that's happening outside. So they're, they're about food security in most cases. But in most countries where food security is an issue, they also have some set-aside areas where there's no fishing. So our countries protecting marine biodiversity, well, they're not really. Um, you know, they might have attempts. I mean, what's the point of setting aside a sanctuary for protected species when the things that are killing it, like fishing bycatch, are, are still going on? 
Um, so in that database and other indicators, how many countries actually have any protected areas? And I was quite shocked that only about one third of the countries, or about one quarter, had a really protected area. So that's it. most coastal countries haven't even got the message and haven't even established one marine protected area. And uh, as my old friend Bill Ballantyne said, you know, once we had one marine reserve in New Zealand, it was like chocolates. Everybody wanted one. Once you went there and you saw the flourishing marine life, people went home and they said, let's have more. And I think that's the case in many countries. They just haven't got it yet that if you had one marine reserve and you see what happens, show the public, then people would appreciate it and they'll want more. So only about 1% of the world ocean is without fishing. And why is this? Well, I've touched on some of these already. Um, people have this idea that the oceans are pristine, but they're not really, and that fishing doesn't alter ecosystems. There's a huge amount of scientific research that shows this, and in hindsight, it kind of makes sense. Um, fisheries are not being managed sustainability in most cases. I've struggled to find any fish fishery that can demonstrate for a few decades that it's being managed sustainably. Most intend to be managed sustainably, but they haven't been able to show they are being yet. And maybe it's just not a political priority. So what about sustainable use? Well, all countries have agreed to sustainably manage the ocean, so great, um, let's, let's do that. But what's that mean? Um, well, let's, if most marine protected areas are just about sustainable use, then you could just call the entire world ocean a marine protected area and say, okay, now we're going to manage this sustainably. So I will end my, my talk there, and I hope the next speakers will be a little bit more um, positive and have some answers to some of the questions I'm proposing. And um, the next speaker is Sue Tai. I'll flip over. Go for it. Okay, thank you. Talofa lava, malosifu, faftai teli lava, Mark, Dan, and welcome again. Thank you for making the time to come. You'll have to forgive me a bit. I'm fighting the flu. I have flu brain. I'm trying not to, um, to spread it, but um, hopefully I can keep some logical thought. Um, Mark's asked me in this Ocean 2030 to speak about Pacific Islands region. For me, um, I didn't grow up in Samoa actually, but I know my Samoan heritage back over 400 years. I grew up in New Zealand, uh, with lots of Samoan aunties, but as I approach uh, well over the age of 55, I've lived more than half of my life in Samoa and uh, am married to a Samoan um, and have traveled and worked in every Pacific Island country. So I'm an islander by heart and by nature with blood ties to the islands of Manono, Opolu, Savai, um, also Tongatapu and Vavau, as far as I've been able to find out here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and a few islands further north called England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, in talking about the Pacific Islands, I'm going to state what might be obvious to some, um, but coming back to New Zealand five years ago to live seems to have got a bit lost. And that as I talk about the Pacific, it's inclusive of New Zealand, the Pacific Islands. New Zealand is a Pacific island, a little bit larger than Samoa, Vanuatu, or even Palau. But I see very much New Zealand as a Pacific island, and Auckland as one of the largest Pacific island cities in the world. New Zealand, like its fellow Pacific island nations, has a plan that it signed up to have a vision for the ocean by 2030. Indeed, I believe the 2030 here was chosen in part because the global community has signed up to a plan for the Sustainable Development Goals. The Pacific, including New Zealand, fought for one specific goal on oceans called Life Below Water. And SDG 14, Sustainable Development Goal number 14, focused on the oceans. Um, overall goal is to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas and marine resources for sustainable development. Just as I go through this talk, remember the last three words, for sustainable development. Um, and think maybe, is there something missing? When you look at the sustainable development goals that we're going to have done by 2030, they are very laudable. They are very needed. 
And in fact, if the ocean could speak to us today, it would tell us, if we thought of the ocean as a person, I think it would speak to us today, as, as shown by Mark's presentation, that we have given tremendous insult to the ocean through pollution, through plastics, through overfishing, through dredging, through reclamation. I love that word reclamation. It sounds like you're claiming something back. Actually, you're not. You're stealing land from the ocean. Most reclamations are. And of course, through to climate change. So the um, 10 goal areas, seven of which have targets, cover everything from marine pollution to sustainable management and protection to ocean certification, harvesting regulation and ending overfishing, and the one that Mark referred to, 10% marine protected areas that I'm going to take a bit of a deeper dive to, fishery subsidies, increasing economic benefits to SIDS, that's small island states and least developed countries, increasing capacity, knowledge transfer and science, access for small fishers, and implementing something called, almost added as an afterthought to the SDGs, quite odd really, when you really read what UNCLOS is, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. Well indeed, ladies and gentlemen, it is about time it was implemented, and I'm going to outline why. So 2030 may seem some way off, but actually when you look at the targets for these various areas, some of them aren't too far off. The marine pollution target, land-based sources, plastics, 2025. Okay, I've got six years up our sleeve. Sustainable management and protection, 2020. Mm, that's a bit closer. Ocean acidification, didn't give a time-bound target for that one. Ending overfishing and harvesting regulation, 2020. I hope the fishing industry is busy. 10% of marine protected areas, we've heard effectively less than 1%. I'm not going to argue the numbers, but I'm going to give a Pacific view on what's happening in MPAs. Fishery subsidies, two years out. Um, economic benefits, a bit further out. And the other ones don't actually have a time frame, so I'm assuming it's by 2030. So if you're a young person in this room looking for a career and interested in oceans, I think it could be a damn good bet because there is a lot to do by 2030. And certainly I want to be retired by then. <laughs> so let's go back to the Pacific and think about how we've seen the Pacific through human eyes. Bearing in mind, I want you to just keep in the back of the mind, think of the ocean was a person and talking to you. But how have we seen the Pacific over all these years? On the left there is a star map. So uh, voyages, Pacific Island voyages, including Micronesians, this is one from um, the Federated States of Micronesia from a navigator called Mu Pilon. And it's a star map of the Pacific to navigate ways to get to certain islands. I saw the similarity in the one on the right, which is from 1769 from Tupaia, who was with the uh, voyages of Cook, and that was his map of areas radiating out from, from his island, which is now in French Polynesia, but quite similar in terms of how um, at least he viewed uh, the map of the ocean or his nearby ocean neighborhood. Fast forward to the 15th, 16th, 1700s, and, and when Europeans started exploring the Maris Pacifica, uh, this was the kind of map they used, with a massive suspected um, continent, uh, the southern, southern land, not quite that, and really quite interesting views about the ocean and starting to claim over those centuries territories within it. Fast forward sort of more to last century, and... Um, the ocean started having names on countries. It had codified the sort of three nautical miles sort of domains that the Europeans had put in place. I wonder if any of you know why it was three nautical miles that was originally given as ocean territory. Purely because that's how far you could fire a cannonball. So that's how far you could defend. That was expanded to 12 nautical miles. In the Pacific, we did have ocean tenure too. It largely went to the reef. 
And even today in places like Samoa, even though there's a Westminster style constitution and below high tide water level belongs to everyone and, and all is good and happy, actually when you're out in the kua and you're working out in the villages, the tenure goes from ridge to reef and the ocean is seen as a highway that connects. Um, up until the 1970s, this was sort of the map. So by this time, we sort of had territorial seas. Um, no marine protected areas in the way uh, Westerners would think marine protected areas, but actually many, many hundreds of years of MPAs, be they called Guala, Rahui, Bu, um, Sa, uh, places that were protected for various reasons and species. Fast forward today, and uh, this is sort of the image you see, where we have given ourselves, our nations, rights to the ocean. So beyond how far we could fire a cannonball through to claims and, and disputes, the Icelandic and British Cod Wars. In fact, the Americans, the year that we recognized as a civilization the need to recognize human rights, the Americans actually claimed beyond 12 nautical miles, shortly followed two years after in 1947 by Chile and Peru who started uh, advocating for the wider claims to EEZ. But it wasn't until 1982 when they passed the law of the sea and which gave rise to these maps of today where the sovereign rights and the sovereign jurisdiction of out to 1200, uh, 200 nautical miles was recognised. So this is our map today where we have given ourselves rights to the ocean. Sovereign rights within 12 nautical miles, that's ours. Out to 200 nautical miles, unless you've got a neighbour within that space, sovereign rights. And beyond that is something called the high seas, quite a big part of our planet, in which it is the common heritage of humankind. Although I think it originally said mankind. With UNCLOS in 1982, few people realise um, that actually these rights came with responsibilities, most of which have not been lived up to whatsoever, in my view. They boil down to four things. The right to explore. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the, the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Put more money into that. The right to exploit. Well, actually, we've done pretty well on that. I would say 100%, because no nation has not claimed sovereign jurisdiction, and still many of those boundaries are being disputed. For Samoa, we're in dispute of every single one of our four boundaries with our neighbours. Uh, still, today, in 2018, when this convention came into force in 1982. The right to conserve. Hold that thought. And because UNCLOS treated um, the ocean recognised it needed to treat the problems of the ocean in an integrated way as a whole, management. Management, that means you actually do something, including things like MPAs. I want to take that thinking of UNCLOS and those four rights and responsibilities. I can't in the time available, and I've got to watch the time, uh, look at all the sustainable development goals about what New Zealand and the Pacific and the global community have agreed to, that our ocean will be like by 2030. I just want to focus in quickly on MPAs to keep in line with Mark's talk. So in 1982, the uh, world agreed UNCLOS and we started having these areas of our countries. And actually it was great because the first time you could see us, you could see Pacific Island states. We weren't just this blank blue. And the Pacific Island states have very zealously fought for and still do to this day their ocean domain. Because for many countries like Kiribati, it really is their only economic resource. So back in 1985, a few years after, and I'm looking at conserve now and I'm exampling MPAs as a tool, we had the Great Barrier Reef totally within the territorial sea, not the EEZ. And I'm only going to look at large-scale MPAs. There were many small-scale, but as you've heard from Mark, their contribution to ocean conservation, very local, important, not um, 
uh, putting them down at all, but I want to give you a picture of ocean scale. Uh, smaller scale NPAs, like Lee, are vital. But if we're really going to address the implementation of UNCLOS and what our ocean needs to be like in 2030, we need to go to scale. We need to go to the scale of the ocean. So three years after UNCLOS had um, been agreed, 1985, Great Barrier Reef. Ten years on, Great Barrier Reef. Ten years on, 20 years, Great Barrier Reef. Well, during that time, we exploited the hell out of the ocean. You've seen Mark's slide that sees around us. Um, and certainly we're exploring it, at least the fishermen were. Um, we weren't really doing a good job at conserving. 2015, a couple of years ago, there's been a sea change or an ocean change. A big part of that has been driven by the Pacific and going to scale because within these EEZs, within a Pacific island, way, at least for the Pacific sites, the fundamental philosophy of an islander was if you were going to survive on an island, you used some, you saved some. So there were bull protected area, there were Rahui in the Cook Islands, there were SARS. These were the MPAs. But they've gone to scale, applying these kind of thinking with others, including the United States, and hopefully still, if they don't rewind uh, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, Papahana Mokuakea, which is being talked about by the Trump government. But 2015, we definitely had a sea change. Some countries were stepping up, or are stepping up. And what will that be like in 2030? Will it be enough? I want to give you three short stories, watching the time, you good? of ones that I've had the privilege to be involved in that help change that map. Um, anyone ever been to Kiribati? Wonderful! <laughs> I'd like to meet you. Not many people in New Zealand sometimes even know Kiribati. Um, Kiribati is the only nation um, that has uh, jurisdiction or territory in all four hemispheres of the planet. It has three large EEZs, totaling over um, 3 million square kilometers, no, 3 million square kilometers. A middle piece of its EEZ, that middle arm that's coming down, is the jurisdiction known as the Phoenix Islands. In two, based on surveys, in 2006, they declared PIPA, the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. I can't give you much detail. I do lecture in the courses on the story of PIPA and, and happy to share publications on it. But one of the smallest nations in the world with only one patrol boat, whose nation is spread over three different pieces of exclusive economic zone. You can't even travel to them and you can't fly to these islands. Managed to successfully close this area, half of its Phoenix EEZ, to fishing and any other extractive practice, except for around the island of Canton, which sustains the local community. They closed it on the 31st of December um, 2014, and it has remained effectively closed since that time with a couple infractions, including prosecutions. The smallest country in the world shut down half of its EEZ, a country who, half of its Phoenix EEZ, well over 10%, 11.35% of its total EEZ, so it's already blown the 10% target, and they did it. They did it and been independently verified. Now they're looking by 2020 to integrate that protected area within the EEZ and perhaps charge higher license fees to secure further economic benefit from the PIPA. Because Kiribati, over 70% of its GDP is fishing fees. So it is not an option not to fish. It is its main economic lifeline. But even Kiribati, a nation of only 100,000 people, can achieve that with some help from partners. Palau, move further to the north and to the west. Has anyone been to Palau? Great, a beautiful country, one of the most amazing countries on the planet. If you're a diver, you have to dive in Palau. It should be on your bucket list. In 2014, President Ramangasau made an amazing announcement when they hosted the forum. And they plan, <coughs> excuse me, by 2020, 
to um, shut down 80% of their exclusive economic zone, that light blue area, no extractive activity. And the uh, hatch darker blue area there around the main islands, that's a domestic fishing zone to prioritise local food security and also to prioritise tourism. Palau earns 70% of its GDP mostly from tourism. But the trouble is tourists coming in like to eat the reef fish and uh, there's not a lot of reef fish for Palauans. It's very, only a small area of coral reefs. So measures are being looked at to put in place to give access to pelagics. But prioritising a domestic fishing zone. But shutting down 80% of the EEZ. Pretty bold move. But they've built on it from a successful protected area network, which we've had the honour of working with them. I'll be in Palau on their protected area network fund board in a couple of weeks, because they've done it sustainably financed themselves through tourism fees. So they have that small network of MPAs and terrestrial areas, and then they decided to apply that success and thinking to their whole domain. And this is their recipe. And bear in mind, any illegal fishing that goes into that zone and is caught now, they will burn the boats. Cook Islands. I'm sure a lot of you have been to the Cook Islands, right? Nobody in Auckland can't know about the Cook Islands. They've taken this sort of whole domain approach too, built from the philosophy of traditional Maori culture and the Rahui, and they've made a plan called the Marae Moana, basically translating to sacred ocean. The Marae is a sacred place. They've done a policy, they've legally designated it. The first zonation, it's across their entire domain, maritime domain. Those red hatched areas are no-go zones, marine reserves. They are from out to 50 nautical miles. So from 12 to 50 nautical miles is complete protection, amounting to just under 20% of their ocean domain makes the CBD targets look a bit weak, and even the SDG ones. So I could give you more, but I don't have the time. But the message there is the Pacific is stepping up to meet its obligations and its rights and responsibilities. They're also rethinking MPAs. So if we have a 10% global goal, and globally I put three, you're saying one. Depends how you define MPA. Whether you're working in the kuwa of Samoa, when you focus on that little bit, everybody focuses in and fights about that. What about the rest? It's the same at an EZ level. It's the same at an ocean level. No matter what scale you're working, as soon as you make these small goals, people argue about what's in there. What's happening to the rest? The pro as you've heard from Mark, the progress to 2030 globally is underwhelming, even with some spectacular examples of the Pacific. Have we got the right starting point? There is a sea change going on in our region, and the examples I've shown you, and I could show you others, that they're going to a whole domain approach and thinking about their zones as protected and justifying use. There is a desire to transition from these unconnected sectorial management of resources and manage ridge to reef to ocean, which is in keeping with every Pacific Island culture I've ever experienced. There's also the wonderful return of voyaging, a renaissance in the voyaging canoe. We had our Samoan canoe, Nalofa, down here, doing a, a voyage around the North Island only earlier this year. Also globally, and of course here in New Zealand, there's the rise of a legal rights of nature debate. And there's recognition that we need an ocean change to deal with climate change. So back to MPAs and just this 10% and what we're doing there. Maybe we need to rethink them. Maybe MPAs, if you think about it, are really limiting human use rights, our rights to the ocean. So when we create an MPA, what are we really doing? I mean, the fish don't know. We're restricting our access rights, our use rights. Perhaps they could be seen more as a MPA should be seen more as a tool for recognition of nature rights. And as you go from the experience of small and large, maybe these large sites like in Palau are actually a recognition that the ocean areas have rights. Perhaps we need recognition of our kinship to the ocean. 
marrying the Pacific Island view or Maori indigenous people's view of the ocean being the mother of all things through to the modern legal rights debate that actually started in the US in the 70s for rights of nature. Maybe we need to join those together for a new vision of ocean kinship. In fact, last year, 2030, um, Henry Puna, Prime Minister of the Cook Islands, and the arch one of the architects of the Marae Moana, I won't read that out, I know I'm, I'm getting close to time, um, reflected on this. And at a session we were at together, this is from his speech, and I'll just read the last paragraph. And so we must consider the rights of the ocean. For just as those who have been treated unfairly have found it necessary to claim their rights, women's rights, human's rights, so too has the ocean been treated with injustice and disrespect. And so now we find it necessary to enable the ocean to claim its rights. So here's a vision for Ocean 2030 or before, a vision of ocean kinship. Imagine if, within national jurisdictions, countries accorded legal persona rights to their ocean domain. Would this be that different in principle to according legal rights to their mountains, as they have in Ecuador, or forests, or rivers, as we have done in New Zealand? The legal basis or the legal logic is not that different. Imagine if, together, nations accorded legal persona rights to the high seas in areas beyond national jurisdiction, to really conserve those as the common heritage of the ocean and humanity. Imagine if New Zealand, together with the Pacific Islands, as a Pacific Island nation, took a leadership in this ocean change. We've already seen, through the Whanganui case and others, that this marrying of legal thinking with an indigenous Maori's views about the mana and the Maori of these places is changing the way we manage places. And this is perhaps what we need, an ocean change. Fundamentally, a change from rights to the ocean that we have accorded ourselves over centuries, ever since that first cannonball flew, to rights for the ocean. And in that way, we'll all benefit. Fafte Tali Lava, thank you. It's a hard act to follow. Oh, come on, yeah, you're right. But keep imagining. I want you to keep, um, as, as Sue asked you to, keep, keep that imagination space going. And so I'm going to um, imagine that following this lecture series, and maybe this lecture itself, the attendees resolved that all was not well in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and that we determined to take action to redress the dire situation we find ourselves in. Tired of the endless focus and activity spent diagnosing and detailing the slow, or the not-so-slow, death of our rivers, our estuaries, our harbours, our oceans, and the biota therein, what the people really wanted was action. And so although this lecture series acted as a catalyst for action, the timing was perfect. So I'm going to get, set up the timing, and they're going to take us to that dream space as we wrap up this lecture. And so against the odds, and you know, despite the best practice, incessant measuring and over-diagnosing of our dying waterways and oceans, signs of positive change have been quietly emerging over the past few decades. One example was the establishment of the Hauraki Gulf Marine Park in 2000. You know, despite the aspiration behind the Marine Park Act, alarm at the slow but steady degradation of the marine environment and the ecosystems, led a group of visionaries in the Hauraki Gulf Forum, supported by councils, together with some government agencies, to facilitate the first marine spatial planning in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in the hopes that it would address the decline. And so with the UN Best Practice Guide to Work From, in true Kiwi fashion, we innovated again, most notably through employing a super-collaborative approach. 
What that meant was there were no agencies around that design of the Marine Spatial Plan. It was just the stakeholders. And furthermore, through a rigorous and what I've heard it described as brutal process of determining who would be those people who sat around the table, they were asked to take off their representative hats and think and act as the voice of the Gulf. The vision that had been put forward was that the Marine Spatial Plan would result in healthy ecology, economy and Modi. Now importantly, um, Maturanga Māori, comprising Māori knowledge, uh, values and worldview, was integral to this process. Not because of there was some treaty right or because you know, we had to do it, um, but because of the immense value it brought to the process and ultimately to the plan. And your kia mauki te mauri o te taia o te kapa moana, te moana o toi. Enhance the, the life-supporting capacity, the, the essence of, of the Hauraki Gulf. Now that's a vision I can buy into. And the multi-sector stakeholder working group produced the Sea Change Taitumu Taipari Marine Spatial Plan for the Hauraki Gulf. After extensive community and iwi engagement, it was released in 2016. Sadly, to resounding silence. One of um, those amazing concepts that, that Sue's already mentioned that was integral to the Marine Spatial Plan was kiota ki tai, um, meaning from, from, to mountain to sea and, and kind of from ridge to reef to ocean. Featured prominently in that plan. And another innovation was proposed in that Marine Spatial Plan, this concept of ahu moana, where you would take one kilometre out from every single piece of coastline within the Hauraki Gulf Marine Park, and then you would say to the people who live in that catchment, and it had to be catchment based, because although it's so logical that what we do on the land impacts what happens in the ocean, sadly our regulatory systems and our legal frameworks don't really allow for that to happen. And so Aho Moana was proposed to try and get around that challenge, whereby the people who lived in that catchment would have a say over what happened in that one kilometre stretch out from the coastline. What else has been going on? Well, the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge has a vision for New Zealand to have healthy marine ecosystems that provide value for every New Zealander. And I quote that directly off, off the website. And in particular, there is a strong focus on ecosystem-based management. I think that's a vast improvement from managing single-stock approach of, say, snapper one or, or crayfish. Like Sue said, the fish don't know whether they're in a marine reserve or they're in that quota management area. So the idea of managing from an ecosystem is definitely an improvement from that current system. One of the ideas that sits alongside ecosystem-based management is tipping points. The point beyond which a degraded and constantly stressed ecosystem slips maybe into total meltdown. The point of no return. And while I see the value of the concept in particular, we're trying to understand how ecosystems function when placed under stress. And like Mark said, all of them are under some form of stress. And perhaps how much pressure they can withstand um, it is when tipping points start getting employed as decision-making parameters that I start to experience real discomfort for two key reasons. First, we simply might have got it wrong. As scientists, we do our best to get it right, but we can sometimes get it a bit off. Like when we assumed the growth and reproduction rates for, say, orange ruffy were the same as snapper. That didn't work out so well. And we're still trying to understand the difference between cumulative and compounding effects, for example, particularly in these complex ecosystems. So that's the first reason why um, I'm not so comfortable with tipping points. The second, and perhaps this is the most important, because tipping points become like the default speed limit. Let me explain what I mean by that. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I like to think I'm a pretty law-abiding citizen of this country. I pay my taxes, I don't litter, and I don't speed, and therefore I drive to the speed limit. However, in trying to maintain a speed right at that limit, I must confess, and here in front of you all, I have on some very rare occasions slid slightly over 
that speed limit. For me, that's quite easy. I can just ease off the gas or I can just touch the brakes a little bit. However, when we're dealing with entire ecosystems, the danger of slipping just over the tipping point has far more wide-reaching consequences. I would argue that using tipping points to drive management, and in particular, say, quota decisions, is fraught and fundamentally flawed. We should instead be perhaps managing for abundance. Then, last year, the new Labour-led government uh, came to power with an ambitious environmental reform agenda. Significant changes were proposed for the Resource Management Act, urban development, freshwater management. We've got a climate change commission. Conservation funding has been increased, and a plan for a billion trees to be planted has been declared. Well, I do have to say I have some reservations about what types of trees they're planting. However, the government also promised an independent review of the quota management system. Um, enactment of the Takutai Moana Act will be taking place, and customary marine title will be uh, recognised for many iwi and hapu. There was also a lot of debate around this time, this year and last year, always passionate and sometimes not so eloquent or articulate on the rights to free speech. And I'll look back to that towards the end of the talk. And those reforms that were promised were on the back of some various governments passing some of the most beautiful pieces of legislation I think I've ever had the pleasure of reading. Specifically the Te Uriwera Act and the Te Awatupo Act, and I'll get back to those in a minute. But let's just have a quick reality check. 70% of our rivers don't meet swimming standards, and I actually don't know how much of our um, water supply is considered to be kind of fit for, for good consumption all of the time. Half of our lakes are polluted with excess nutrients and are overrun by invasive pests. Sediment chokes most harbours and estuaries. 90% of our wetlands are gone. Depending which number you use, between 18,000 and 34,000 people you know, contract waterborne diseases every year. And then, you know, a deep sea scallop bed that was opened up a few years ago for, for commercial harvest was decimated in two years. This is, does anyone know where this is? It's the Tarawera River. And so, this, this, you know, this, there's nothing illegal about this activity. But look at the impact it's having on our ocean. I use this slide often to demonstrate the impact of, of Modi to the rivers and the oceans. We don't need any empirical measurements for all of us to know that that's not right. So, the details of what we're doing to Earth and how harmful our impacts are, are complex, and some of the facts are controversial, or worse even, just being plain ignored. I mean, this is, this is from the, um, the Tolaga Bay floods just a month or so ago. However, it is patently obvious that we are behaving in a manner which is destroying the Tai Ao, the, the Earth system. We're destroying our oceans. And it's ideas like Kiotiki Tai, from ridge to reef, understanding that what we do on land, which is why all those statistics I gave, mainly were about what's happening on the land, that all goes into the ocean. Mark and Sue have given us a really good overview of the fishing impacts as well, and I don't want to minimise those, but I knew that that's where they were going to be headed. So back to those acts I mentioned. The Te Uriwera Act of 2014, and I'm going to read directly from it. Te Uriwera is ancient and enduring, a fortress of nature alive with history. Its scenery is abundant with mystery, adventure and remote beauty. Te Uriwera is a place of spiritual value with its own mana and modi. Te Uriwera has an identity in and of itself, inspiring people to commit to its care. And this is a classic children of the mist image. And then we have Te Awatupua Act, which is the Wanganui River Act. And I quote again, Te Awatupua is an indivisible and living whole, comprising the Wanganui River from the mountains to the sea, incorporating all its physical and metaphysical elements. I mean, New Zealand, that's law. That's pretty amazing to think about. Now, a common theme in both acts is that, consistent with a Māori worldview, principles and practices, the assertion of rights comes with consequent responsibilities. So all that noise and incessant chatter we've been hearing about rights to free speech, they've forgotten about the responsibilities that go with it. I think that had been brought up, that debate might have been settled pretty quickly. So now let's dare to dream a little. 
I'm going to paint for you a vision of Oceans 2030 that you all enacted following this lecture. In June 2018, a Māori youth delegation presented to the UN in New York a vision to follow the likes of Bolivia and Ecuador and place Papa Tōnuku at the centre of our laws, our Earth Mother. Upon their return to Aotearoa, New Zealand, they presented that same vision to the Department of Conservation Treaty Partner Summit to rapturous applause. At your life, that part wasn't a dream, that actually happened. The next part is the dream. The government has been talking about implementing the Sea Change Taitimu Tai Party Marine Spatial Plan. So let's say it happened for Auckland in the Hauraki Golf Marine Park. And seeing how successful it was, the rest of New Zealand demanded they get a piece of the action and that same opportunity. And so, except where the customary marine title had been recognised, Ahu Moana had been established around the entirety of Aotearoa New Zealand's coastline, giving the power to the people. And where we had been visionary in laws applied to the land, we then turned our gaze toward the ocean. This is the Pacific Ocean, a third of the world's surface. Before it was given that name, it was known by this name, Te Moana Nui Akiwa. Um, and that name is more or less Polynesian. It may extend wider than that, but as best to understand, we can say it's a Polynesian name for the Pacific. What many people won't know is that the personification of the Pacific was in the form of the woman Hine Moana. So the concept of a personality for the Pacific Ocean isn't innovative or new or novel, it's really old. What we were missing were the legal instruments to implement it. So if we go back to that Uriwera Act where it's ancient, enduring, a fortress of nature, abundant with mystery, let's just find all and replace to Uriwera with Hine Moana. She is ancient, enduring. She is a place of spiritual value. She has her own identity in and of itself, inspiring the people to commit to its care. So what if Hine Moana became her own legal personality? What if we gave our EEZ legal personality? It's a reality for Pacific Polynesian people already. <coughs> We'd only be confirming to them something that they hold to be true already. So we need to be careful about how we manage that conversation. I think it's a perfect candidate for international recognition also, given the Polynesian spread. What might hinder that? It's this thing called the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. And this is, um, and you're right, so it was, it was mankind in the original draft. I pulled this from the original draft. Now what underlies, the legal principle that underlies that convention is the concept of Māori nullius. Now, many of you may have heard of terra nullius, the, uh, the doctrine of discovery, which meant that when people turned up and there were no civilised folks, they could claim it. The same thing has been assumed for the oceans. And I'm part of a research team challenging that notion, because if the Pacific Ocean was understood as a person, if the Pacific Ocean was the marae of our ancestors, if the Pacific Ocean wasn't what separated us, it, what, it was what connected us. I argue that the, the legal test that was met in Australia for nullifying um, the concept of terra nullius could be applied in the ocean. So where might that take us? We could establish that structure using the super collaborative approach as was employed in Sea Change Taitumu Taipati. Of course we need to acknowledge that Polynesian people aren't the only people in the Pacific Ocean. But maybe this view and this approach has, has better intergenerational uh, reality than, than the other approaches which have been employed, which are, as both Sue and Mark have said, about what humans can derive from the ocean as opposed to having rights for the ocean. So uh, Mark, Mark posed these questions for us to consider when we're putting together this, this presentation. Can New Zealand follow the example and declare it CEZ and NPA? Well, I say, no, why stop there? Let's go one better. Let's call it 
Hine Moana, like it had been considered in the past, and let's give her her own voice. Let's stop thinking about how much the ocean can sustain us and how much we can sustain the ocean. And finally, if you're thinking, gosh, it's very easy to say in front of a crowd of 50, 60 people in a university, well, I'm going to quote someone else who did seem to do the impossible. It always seems impossible until it's done. Nō reira. Kia ora mai tātou. Um, oh, that's, that's very loud. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the first question because I think you, the others are good questions for us to consider moving forward. But the, the one world, many cultures. What I would add to that is I think most indigenous cultures have a, an ethic of, of sustainability, of intergenerationality to their approach to everything they do. Um, and so the sooner we all realise we're indigenous to this planet, and start behaving accordingly, the better. But I think the other questions you pose are, are magnificent, and maybe we might be able to chat afterwards and jot those down. But yeah, kia ora. Um, were there some other questions? Yeah? Yeah, I had a question about the Pacific Islands. And that is that if caring for the environment is so ingrained into indigenous cultures, why were laws and uh, sustainable use of so zones required at all? Why was the situation good without those rules, and what difference did they make, considering that that traditional knowledge was already there in the first place? That's a big question. Um, I think you have to look at the history of all the islands and the different peoples that were there and that came, and the different regimes that um, uh, were imposed, and the changes in the culture. What I would urge you to do if you want to understand that question, there was a man who unfortunately passed a few years ago. His name was Apali Hofer. He wrote an essay called Sea of Islands, 
Um, there's actually a book um, of his essays called We Are the Ocean. And I think if you read that, you'll get the understanding of both the diversity of the answers to your question and the mix and why we end up with uh, problems today. Um, Islanders had problems. They didn't just come with the Europeans. Anyone who knows the story of Rapa Nui, Easter Island, would know that one. Um, the thing is, uh, same with uh, islands Nukumaroro in uh, the Phoenix Islands. There are signs of civilizations being there, but they didn't survive. Survival in an island, particularly atolls, has a very narrow margin of sustainability related to populations. So these were issues that islanders learned to adapt and survive to or not. Um, with new regimes coming in and things like Westminster-style constitutions and high water and, and all the things that we talked about in UNCLOS, although having some laudable uh, aims, the result was tending to often marginalise traditional management. What we've seen in the Pacific is both a renaissance in traditional management in Guala, in PNG, in Bull, in Palau, in Rahui, in the Cooks, in SARS, in Samoa, Tapu areas, but actually now they're combining the two and applying it to their sovereign domain. So they're going to scale. So, you know, humans are smart creatures and I think it's um, adapting to the situation at hand. Traditional management wasn't perfect, mistakes were made. Modern management is not perfect either. But what we do know is we all depend on that ocean. And if it's not healthy, um, human well-being will not will not result. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I'm not even sure of all my facts, but I just want to look at the permanent issue here in New Zealand, where the government wants to declare the Indian Reserve. We have the Maori that has to object against it, so can you just give us a little bit more insight into that? Sure, and I'll give the abridged um, response that Dion Tuta has given to this question, and he's... Um, I think he's the, the CEO of um, Tuku Kai Moana. Uh, Māori were granted interests and rights in the fisheries up in, in the Kumadek area, um, and as treaty partners, when the government made a decision without um, checking in with the treaty partner and giving them the ability to say, yes, we support this, they guaranteed opposition. And that, that's, those are, I'm um, paraphrasing Dion's response, but that was, that's it. I believe discussions on that are still continuing. So. Yeah, I would say it's a good idea. It didn't uh, benefit from a decent process. Local iwi that have rights to those islands um, were supportive, but um, the way Dan just summarised it was correct. These things at scale only work if you have this, what you were calling it, super collaborative approach, an inclusive approach. If you keep stakeholders on the outside, you can't expect them to support it. Personally, I think the Kermadex is a, a great idea. It is a marine reserve out to the territorial seas. This was taking it further out to the EEZ. I agree. It's just process. We might have time for one or two more questions, if there are any. Um, if there aren't any, I think um, I'll thank, we can thank all the audience for turning up and listening to us. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.